What an amazing, an amazing thing. Thank you, choir, orchestra. Would you all thank them with me one more time for all they've done? Um, it's been an amazing morning of music. I hate to mess it up with my sermon, but uh, it's been a great time of worship. I hope you have been able to worship well this morning. Will you pray with me for a moment, please? Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be clung to. But he emptied himself and took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this morning, Lord Jesus, we are well aware you are in this room with us. We know you are present and it is you that we worship today it is your glory that we seek this morning it is your will that we pray is done and may we together have the mind of Christ as we deal with each other and as we relate to you and as we bow before you today for it is in Jesus name that we ask this, and all of God's people said, amen. Welcome to the best Easter ever. We are so glad that you are here, and uh, we have had uh, just tremendous morning, tremendous uh, attendance around us. We've had, I think, this is our third service in here. We've had two across the way in the gym, and uh, two more in Building A, filled with children. So uh, it has been an incredible morning in worship today, and uh, I thank you for being a part of it. This is, this is my 30th Easter as your pastor, 30 years preaching Easter sermons. Um, and I, I say that to you, I should have it all figured out by now. Um, I say that to you next year. I, I'm, if things go along, I'll be retiring around the first of the year, and, and uh, so I'm not sure what will happen next Easter. But for those of you who may only come once a year, I just wanted you to know not to be surprised <laughs> next year when you, when you come back and there's maybe a different guy up here. But, but uh, let, me, let me tell you something. Uh, I hope you know by now I love you. I hope you know that. Uh, And you have loved me well. If there's ever a need for a testimony about a church that loves their pastor, I've got it right here. And you have done that unbelievably well. And I will never forget that. I'm grateful to God for it. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. If we can't love each other in this room, we have absolutely nothing to say to this world. If we can't love each other in this family, we have no message to export. Because the Bible says anything we say is like an empty gong, a clanging cymbal. It's noise. It means nothing. So today, I want you to know you are loved. I want you to know that if you came in here today wondering if you were loved, we want you to know that God loves you too. But we're here today to show you that we mean what we're talking about, and we're glad that you're with us here on this Easter Sunday morning. He is risen. risen Excellent. We almost got that right. Let's try one more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Perfect. All right. Good. And that is our greeting, and that is our confidence, and that is our confession this morning. I want us to take a moment and, and look at a passage of Scripture from 1 Peter chapter 1. I couldn't decide. I, I've honestly, uh, 
<clears throat> part of my problem this morning has been I have so many things I would like to say, and I want to pour everything into this one Easter message. Uh, and uh, so this is going to be a really long message this morning is all I can tell you. I don't know what else to say. I've got about 10 different sermons floating in my head. I like to go, oh, let's talk about that. Let's go there. But, but the Spirit of God just really dealt with my heart about preaching a message that is clearly evangelism, and I don't do that well. I'll just be honest with you. That's not my strong suit. So I have to really lean on God in this. I, this is not my uh, sugar stick that I can turn to and just watch it happen all the time. But uh, I know you'll pray for me as we walk through this together. In First Peter chapter 1, there's a doxology in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded, being kept through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. I want to talk about the resurrection morning as the women came to the tomb. They came expecting to embalm a body. There was no body there when they arrived. There were angels there. And the angels asked them a question. What are you, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are you looking for the living one among the dead ones? Literally is what the text says. Why are you looking for the living one among the dead ones? There's absolutely no doubt in our minds that Jesus Christ was physically resurrected. Now, there are many people who believe, well, he, well it, his ideal it still continues, and his movement still continues, and his teaching still continue, and that's what resurrection means. No, it isn't. It means he was a corpse in a tomb. And he came back to life on the third day. He was buried. He was, he was killed on a cross. He was buried in the tomb. And he came back to life on the third day. His body came back to life. There was a survey a while back that said 75% of American Christians do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me correct that number. 100% of people who do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ are not Christians, okay? If you believe in the resurrection of Jesus, you are a Christian. If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But the contingency is you believe, not just the idea of resurrection, not just, well, one day everybody's going to live. No, 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 no. Jesus overcame death at the grave. A New Testament scholar named Jaroslav Pelikan said this. He said, if Christ is risen, nothing else matters. If Christ is risen, nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen, nothing else matters. Now think about that. If he is risen, nothing is more important. Nothing else matters compared to that. It changes everything about your life if you accept and believe the reality that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. And that is what we celebrate together as Christians today. Not the idea of a resurrection, but the reality of a physical resurrection that happened on that Easter morning. 
and the, 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 the theories that have grown up around how this happened, what happened, are, are absolutely nonsense. There's only one reality, only one explanation for what happened in that graveyard on that first Easter morning. Jesus is alive. That is our confession. That is our belief. That is, our, that is the foundation of our faith. But I, I don't want to just argue that idea today. That's, this is not an apologetics lesson. I don't want to just do that today. I want to tell you why it matters to you. Why does that matter to you? Okay, well, this is the reality. That's great. So what? Why does that matter? How does that change me? How does that affect me? How does that, how does that move the, the direction, the needle of my life in a different direction? So I'm going to tell you four things that the resurrection does for you. Four gifts that God gives us from an empty tomb because of an empty tomb, because the grave of Jesus Christ was indeed empty on that Easter morning, that first Sunday morning. He did, in fact, come back from the dead. Because of that, there are four things that these women got when they went to the tomb, but you get these two, all right? And this is what Peter's talking about. The first thing he says is this. We have an inexhaustible hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have an inexhaustible hope. Now, if you don't have hope in that which is eternal, your hope will wear out. There are a lot of people who use the word hope. They throw the word hope around. You know, well, I hope gas prices go down. Anybody there on that one? I hope gas prices go down. I hope inflation doesn't go up. I hope my son comes home. I hope I get the new job. But none of those are, are, are based in any reality. They're hope and they're, and they're temporary and they don't last. They don't hold. And let me tell you something, friend. You need hope. You need hope. In this world today, if you don't have hope, if you don't have a real inexhaustible hope that, and, and the living hope that Peter talks about, this living hope that has caused us to be born again in Jesus Christ is a hope that continues to renew itself over and over and over again. I've been a Christian for over 45 years. Let me tell you something. I've never run out of hope yet. 45 years worth. There's no time expiration. There's no time limit on the hope that we receive in Jesus Christ, and we need it. I'll tell you the most hopeless things that I do sometimes, and I've sat with some pretty dire, pretty dire situations in my life. But one of the most hopeless things I do is, is to stand at a funeral service with a family who has no hope for the person who's lying in that casket, who knows this person has rejected everything about faith, everything about God, and now they're standing here looking at a hopeless end. That is the most hopeless thing you can do. And it tears my heart out when I see it. Even people I don't know well. When I see, they have no hope. None whatsoever. We need hope. Not shallow hope. You know, not, you know every, listen, every, every newlywed, every bride and groom have this moment. I, I can watch it happen. You know, the, the groom stands over here and his bride comes up on the platform and He's looking, and you know what he's thinking? Let me tell you what he's thinking. He's thinking, I hope she never changes. Okay? I hope she always stays this pretty. I hope she's all, wow, you know, he's in love. Okay? She's over here going, I hope I can change him. You know, and, and, <laughs> and folks, listen, the reality is this. Both of them are going to be disappointed, okay? Both of them are going to go, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. Because he's not going to change, and she is, and that's just the way it goes. But we're not talking about that kind of hope. That's superficial. That's not based in reality. You have a reality. My hope, what's the song? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We'll sing later the song, Living Hope. Living, we have a living hope in Jesus Christ. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we have hope. You have hope today because of that. The second thing we get as a result of that empty grave is we get an imperishable inheritance. 
an imperishable inheritance. So let me tell you something. If you're counting on mom and dad to give you money today when, you, when, you, you know, when they move on, you know what's happening to your inheritance today? It's getting less and less and less and less. It's not because they're out here on a spending spree, okay? It's because inflation is chipping into the savings. That's what's happening. Believe me, I'm paying attention to my savings today. I'm paying attention to retirement. You know, and you're seeing those funds just dripping, 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 and that's, that's what happens to earthly riches. You have an, an imperishable inheritance that, that's undefiled, that, that will never go away, that will never drain away, it will never be subject to inflation, or as Jesus said, as moth or rust won't corrupt it. There's no way you're going to lose any of the inheritance that you have because of Jesus Christ. We have an imperishable inheritance. You know, there's a uh, story about a little boy that came to his grandpa one time and said, Grandpa, he's about six or seven years old. He said, Grandpa, can you make a sound like a frog? Grandpa said, I sound like a frog, like ribbit? He said, I don't know. He said, well, why do you want me to make a sound like a frog? He said, because Mom said that when you croaked, we're going to go to Florida. So... <laughs> End of the day. Don't, don't rush your inheritance, by the way. But that, you know, we have, an imp- we have an imperishable inheritance. You know, the good news is if you're in the family of God, when you pass away, then you might have been broke as you could be on this earth. You, you might have just been poor. You, you might not have been able to afford the O-R on poor. You're just poor. You didn't, couldn't even afford the last two letters. You were so broke. But when you get there, you are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And everything that belongs to him also belongs to you. We have an imperishable inheritance. Third, we have the gift of an inexpressible joy. We have an inexpressible joy. Now, some of y'all have lost your joy lately, haven't you? I can see it on your faces. Some of you have lost your joy. It's not there like it used to be. We can give our joy up, but it can't be taken from us. We have to voluntarily give it up. If you don't know the joy of the Lord today and you are a Christian, it's because somewhere along the line you have voluntarily surrendered your joys. Get it back. We have the promise of a joy that is, Peter calls it, an inexpressible joy. We have a joy that is so great we can't even talk, we can't even explain it. We can't express it. We have a joy that comes in spite of suffering. Now, the Bible's very honest. The Bible is a very, very honest book. It may not always be easy to hear what it's saying, but it's very honest. How many of you are going through a trial right now? I mean, you're going through maybe the deepest trial you've ever been in in your life. And it's a challenge to you. And you're wondering, why is God letting me go through this? Why is God letting me walk through this kind of time? What, what, is, what have I done? Is God mad at me? Now, no, Peter says this. He said the, the trials that we go through are, he calls them necessary trials. They're necessary. In other words, all God's children are going to experience them. Now, it, it also says that these trials are varied they're, they're not all the same. It's like it's a patchwork quilt. There's a various kinds of trials that people experience. Everybody doesn't go through the same time, the same kind of trial. They're varied, they're varied trials, but they're also varied outcomes. See, God has different purposes for a trial in your life. Sometimes the trial comes, dear one, I hope you hear this right. Sometimes the trial comes to toughen you up to temper you like steel is tempered with heat and trials, stress and tension. And sometimes a trial comes to soften your heart because your heart's hard. And so suffering comes to to just hammer that up a little bit and soften your heart. But the outcome of every trial has this end in mind. Now, this is why he talks about the refiner and gold. Some of you wearing gold today, real gold. You got the real stuff on. And let me tell you what happened to that gold before it became that bracelet or necklace or ring, whatever you're wearing. That gold was put through heat. 
When it comes out of the ground, you know, you've, been to, you've, you've seen this, know this. It comes out of the ground, it's, it's packed in with impurities and other kinds of cheaper kinds of rock and metal and stuff. And the only way you can get it out is to heat it. You have to put it in the fire. You put it in the furnace. And, and the smelter, the, the, the refiner, has a process that they put this through. Once that gold is heated up, because it's a heavier metal, it floats to the bottom. It liquefies and then sinks to the bottom of the mold that it's in. And the impurities stay on the surface, so the refiner can just come along and scrape those impurities out of the way. You know how they know when it's done? You know how they knew in biblical times how it was done, when it was done? How do you know it was hot enough? How do you know all the impurities are out? Here's how you could tell. When the gold was pure, the refiner could look at it and see his own face reflected back to it. Okay, so what's that got to do with you and your trial? Here's, here's what. God has a lot of different settings on his furnace. Your setting may not be the one that I'm on. But God is doing something. He is moving the impurities out of your life. And as he scrapes these aside, what he does is he, he does this. He looks at you. And we, when he can look into your life and see his own face reflected back, you're ready. He's purified your faith. See, a lot of us have mixed, we got a lot of stuff mixed in. A lot of impurities mixed in. And these trials come not to, not to destroy you, but to make you look more like Jesus. But Peter is saying even in that trial, you can have joy, an inexpressible joy. I know that's true. Five years ago today, April the 17th, 2017, at about 6.30 in the morning, I watched my wife walk down a hall at Mayo Clinic to have brain surgery. Last time I ever saw her walk. What began then several weeks before was a trial for us. It was the worst trial that either of us had ever been through. Four months later, she passed away. It was the hardest thing I've ever gone through in my life. You, you walked through it with me. I'm not going to say that every day I just woke up with a big smile on my face and how joyful I am that this had all happened to my wife. I, I, that, would, that would be a lie, and that would be ridiculous. And yet there was a joy in both of us that sometimes it came out on our faces, sometimes it came out in our laughter, but it never left us. We had a hope that was never extinguished, even in the flames of that trial. And I'll tell you this today. If I did not know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that my wife, number one, is in heaven today with the Lord, and number two, that she is going to experience resurrection physically one day, I would have lost my mind by now. I would have lost my mind. But I know what the resurrection means. I know what the promise of God is. And I know that even death does not cancel that promise. Your death, the death of someone you love, does not cancel that promise. The reality is God will walk with you in the trial, whatever that trial may be. Whatever it is you may be experiencing, no matter how severe he has not forgotten you. He has not forgotten you. And in this experience, the outcome is going to be we will look more like Jesus. We will look more like Jesus. The testing of your faith. There's, there's a, the result of that is a faith that will glorify God. The outcome of your faith, the salvation of 
your souls. Finally, we have this incredible gift. And we have the gift of an irreversible salvation. Now, why irreversible? I hear people say sometimes, and especially when I'm talking to them about making a decision for Christ, well, pastor, I would do that, but I'll tell you what. I know, I know myself. I know how I am. I know I'm inconsistent, and I know I won't be able to live this out. I'm not going to make a promise to God that I can't keep. I know I can't stop drinking. I can't stop doing drugs. I can't stop this. Or I won't stop that. I know that, so I'm not, even go- I, I'm, I'm not going to make a promise that I can't keep. Listen, it's not up to you to keep it. You do not keep yourself in salvation. What does Peter say? He says, you are kept by God's power through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You are kept by God's power. You see, on the cross, Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin, though he never personally committed sin. Paul reminds us that as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But we still experience the wages of sin, which is death. The soul that sins it shall die. Jesus conquered death on Easter. He didn't cancel it. It's still still operative, but one day it will be canceled too. But for now, it's conquered. He overcame it. And that means you get to overcome it. That means you will not be held by death any more than he was held by death in that tomb. We receive a salvation that we could not earn, could not deserve, that's purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And God will not take it away from you. He will not yank it back after he gives you that gift. He has promised my power. I will keep you in my power through faith unto salvation. Imagine for a moment you're a grandparent or a a mom or dad, and you've got a five-year-old in your care. I'm saying that because my granddaughter's five, and I take care of her sometimes. So I know how wiggly they are. I know how curious they are. I know how they can do things that sometimes, you know, you go, oh, what are you doing? So when, when you're, you're, you've got your grandchild with you, and let's just say you decided to take a walk, and, and the walk... Part of the walk involved having to walk on this really high bridge. It's kind of dangerous, but it was a beautiful view, and you wanted your grandchild to see it. So you walk across this bridge. You get about halfway out. They, they get away from you. They get too close to the edge, and they slip over. Now, I'm going to slow down the tape in slow motion. you got one of two things you're going to do when that happens. Either you're going to reach down And get that little hand, and you're going to say, now, honey, you need to hang on to my hand as hard as you can right now, because if you let go, you're going to slip over and die. How many of you would do that? You say, well, no, no, well, I'm, I put my hand down here, but it's up to her, it's up to him to hang on. They got to hang on. Do you know that's exactly how some people see salvation? Well, God reached down and God saved me, but now it's up to me. I got to hang on. I got to make sure I'm doing everything right. I got to make sure I'm saying the right thing. I gotta, and we live in continual anxiety that we're going to lose what God has given us. He said, I'm not going to let you lose it because here's what God does. And here's what you would do because you love your grandchild. You're going to reach down and grab that little hand in your hand. And you're going to say, honey, I've got you. And I don't care if my arm comes out of its socket. I'm not going to let go of you. You're saved. Do you know that's what we have in our Redeemer? We have, not only did Jesus pay it all and buy our pardon and forgive our sins on the cross, he gave us a salvation. He said, and by the way, I'll help you keep it. Not up to you to keep it. Not up to you to be perfect. It's not up to you to say, I'll never sin again. 
It's not up to you to promise those kinds of things. He said, I've got you. I saved you, and I'm going to keep you. We have an irreversible salvation. Now, you might say, well, how do I get that? I, I don't have a salvation. What are you talking about? Okay, well, let me tell you. Let me, let me give you the story. This is, let me close with this real quick. The story is told by a Scottish pastor. I, don't, I wish I had a Scottish accent, but you would probably still know I was from Kentucky, so I, I just won't, <laughs> I won't try that today. But this pastor tells a story, just an imaginative story. He said, they, imagine the thief on the cross. There were two thieves that died when Jesus died on Calvary. They died on either side of him. One, they, they both began the morning cursing Jesus. They were cursing. Just because the rest of the crowd, you know how peer pressure is, just the rest of the crowd were cursing him and spitting at him. And they thought, well, we might as well do it too. So they're dying, but they're cursing Jesus while they're dying. One of them continues to do that, but the other one grows silent. He starts looking. And he sees how Jesus is being treated. He notices the sign above his head that says, King of the Jews. He sees the crown of thorns. And something inside of him stirs. And in his last, one of his last gasps of air from the cross, he looked at Jesus and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, you will be with me in paradise. You remember that story? By the way, never too late. Somebody told me between services uh, that her uncle was 97 years old, had rejected everything about Jesus and about faith until his dying breath, and then he received the truth. I wouldn't suggest you play it that way, <laughs> but, but it's not beyond the grace of God, even then. But imagine, this is what the, the, the pastor said. The pastor said, now imagine. He said, what I've always wanted to know is what happened to this guy when he got to heaven? I mean, he, he comes to the pearly gates, and he's standing here in, in the gates of heaven, and he's met by an angel, and an angel comes up and says, well, why are you here? And he says, I don't know. He said, what do you mean you don't know? He said, I don't know. Well, why, well I mean, what, what did you do to, to get here? And he said, I don't know. And the angel taps around on his computer a little bit, and he says, I need to go get my supervisor. So he goes and gets the supervisor angel and brings him back over and says, listen, this, this guy says he doesn't know why he's here. So he looks at him, he says, sir, he said, can I ask you a couple of questions? The man said, yes. He said, what do you know about the doctrine of justification by faith? He said, never heard of it. He said, well, let's go with something simpler. What, what is your view of the Bible? Do you believe that the Bible is God's Word? He said, I've never read it. He said, well, okay, well, okay, well, let's try something else. What church did you belong to? He said, never joined. He said, but, well, what denomination are you from? Don't know what a denomination is. He says, so you're standing here telling me you've never been to church, you've never done anything good, the last thing you did in life was steal something, you got caught, you got killed for doing that, you're, you're going through all of this, and you end up here, and, and you don't know why you're here. What are you doing here? Now listen to the man's answer, because it's important for every one of us. He said, I'm here because the man on the middle cross told me to come. The man on the middle cross told me to come. Let me tell you something, friend. If you are pointing to anything else besides 
that man on the middle cross as your reason for getting to go to heaven when you die, as your reason for receiving eternal life, if you're counting on anything that begins with, well, I did this. Well, I joined a church. Well, I got baptized. Well, I went to Bible studies. Well, I memorized part of the Bible. Well, I'm not a bad person. If that is your answer, dear one, it's the wrong answer. It is not the answer that's going to get you into heaven. Because your ability to get to go to heaven is dependent on the grace of God and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the one who became sin for you, who knew no sin, that you might become his righteousness. And today, if you do not know that Savior, if you do not know Jesus, all your good works, pile them up, pile them up. They're going to burn like dross. They're worth nothing. The only thing that matters is did the man on the middle cross tell you to come? Do you know the man on the middle cross? Do you know who Jesus is? And maybe today in your heart, something speaking to you. You're just like that guy on the cross. I don't know this church stuff. I don't know this religion stuff. I don't know. I'm not a religious person. I don't do these things. I'm just here because mom said if you don't come, I don't get to eat lunch. I'm just here, you know. I don't know all these things. But something is bothering you right now in your heart. You're going, I need what this guy's talking about. I need forgiveness. I need hope. I need joy. I need to know that when I die, it doesn't end. And I get a new life. And today, those are gifts that God will give you if you'll come to him by faith. Bow your heads with me, please. Father, right now, I, I know that there are those that are in this room who maybe are sensing in their own hearts right now there's, there's a need There's a response that they need to make. Friend, I'm not going to pretend this is a comfortable thing for you. I'm just going to tell you. If, if that troubling is happening inside of you right now. I don't care what you think you might be. What you might have thought you were. You might have thought you are the worst person on the planet when you came in here. Or you might think you're the most religious one. But your heart is is troubling you right now you're going I, I just don't know how I feel I'm not sure if, if I were to go to heaven right now if I were to die right now I'm not sure I would go to heaven I don't, I don't know that that would happen for me at all but today you can be sure of that you can have assurance of that you can know that beyond a shadow of a doubt and I'm going to invite you in this moment we're going to stand and sing a song and as we're singing I'm just going to ask you to come down front. Let us talk to you. Let us walk with you through what it means to follow Jesus and to do this according to what the Scriptures say. That's what we want to do. You trust Him. You turn away from your sins. You say, I, I, don't, I don't want to live this way anymore. I want to live for Jesus. And you come to Him and you receive the gift of salvation. It's that easy. It's that easy. You don't have to promise anything. You don't have to become anything. God will give you the grace you need to change. That'll happen. But you need to take a step toward him today and say, God, I hear you. And I'm ready to come. Maybe today, this is your first time in church in a, in a long time, maybe ever. But you just need somebody to pray with you. You're, you're going through some kind of a trial right now yourself, and you don't know what to do. Could just be you're lonely, could be you're sick, could be you're addicted, could be any number of things. We're gonna have some people down front to pray with you if you want to come. We'd love to meet you and take you to God's presence in prayer. So, Father, right now, have your way in every person's heart this morning, every person listening, every person here in this building, next door in the gym, listening on the radio, listening online. Your voice speaks to all of us. 
for some of us right now, we're hearing you say it's time. Today is the day. Make that step. Make that decision to trust Jesus. Friend, we'll welcome you today if that is your decision and you're willing to come. Let's stand together, church family. Let's come.